Arts. We are joined in studio by the re-elected DA leader, John Stienhazen. John, good morning to you and uh, mm. congratulations. It's the first time I've ever seen you <laughs> in studio here. And so, I suspect you are on a campaign trail of sorts. But let's kick off the conversation <laughs> with this. I want to talk about something you said before the speech you made after you won. Mm. So it was that political report. Correct. And you said, this time is different. Mm. I can feel it in my bones. What were you referring to there? And what is it about this moment that is different to any other? Well, I think South Africa has reached a crossroads, and this next election is going to be a crossroads election for the country, mm. where very key choices are going to have to be made about the future. South Africa is in a terrible state. The economy is, is lagging terribly. We're not growing. Mm. Unemployment is rising every single day. Uh, we've got massive infrastructure problems in cities and towns across the country. Mm. And load shedding has reached into the homes of every South African, destroying jobs and causing massive economic damage. Allied with that, massive cr uh, rampant crime increases where South Africans don't feel safe. Yeah. I think that we need to get South Africa into a new trajectory of hope and opportunity. And I just sense that all of these issues are coming together to drive down the ANC support and create opportunities for the opposition in South Africa. Certainly create opportunities <coughs> for your party, at least that's what you would hope. But as with the story that we have just played from my colleague Govin Whittles, there is this disquiet about representation or perhaps let's put it plainly, the small number of black people that are at the top leadership of the Democratic Alliance. Let me just recapture what Govin said. He says there's one black person, one colored person, one Indian, and four white people. Well, you know, Oli, that is what the Congress uh, threw up. I and mean, we, I can't handpick my team like other leaders do. I've got to deal with what the Congress has elected. Our Congress was overwhelmingly um, populated by non-white South Africans. I think that's very clear from the visuals. Hmm. And it's who they chose. And that's what the DA is about. We're about choosing people not on the basis of their race, but on the ability to be able to get the job done and to do what needs to be done. I also think that if you look at our top six in relation to any of the other parties' top six in the country, there is some representation of all South Africans in our top six. The other top sixes of the parties to the left and the right of us are all monochromatic. Hmm. Um, the Freedom Front, all white. The uh, EFF, all black. The ANC, all black. And I think that when people see the DA and they see the representation in our Congress this weekend, they see this diversity and some of themselves represented in it. But your target pool, <clears throat> where you are likely to get the votes that will put you a step higher, and of course, uh, see to it that your hopes of getting the ANC below 50% and perhaps where you most likely would want them to be, which is at around 40%, that can only come from you getting that elusive black vote. So how do you do that with a leadership that looks very white? Well, I think that if you look at, at the recent polling of party political support, the DA's support base is 31% black, 30% colored, 7% Indian, and 30% white. We already have a diverse support base across, the, across all racial and cultural lines in South Africa. Hmm. And it's up to us to now continue to drive the issues that matter to South Africa. I think the next election is going to be around issues like who can end load shedding, who can get the economy working and create jobs, who can keep South Africans safe in their homes. And I think South Africans are increasingly less worried about the color of the person and more worried about how they're going to get those services, how they're going to be kept safe, how they're going to have a better school for their children, how they're going to have better hospitals. And I think people like Chris Pappas, for instance, in Ongeni municipality in KZN mm. are proving very clearly that you don't have to be a black South African to fight every day for the upliftment of the people in Popameni or those areas that have been deprived after 20 years of ANC majority. Yeah. And the advancement that's happening there is precisely because he is fit for purpose. He's able to get out there and do the job and articulate it. And the same for our mayors across the rest of the country. Um, I think it is becoming less of an issue. People are looking desperately for some form of hope that they're going to be able to get a job, yeah. able to be kept safe, and able to have decent services. Well, I'd, I'd like to think that you probably 
are onto something there when you say South Africans are going to look at this and think that uh, this is going to be an issues-based election. So let's talk about what you have put forward as your economic vision. You say you want to do away with uh, the government's temporary jobs scheme. You also want to stabilize the public debt to GDP. Is that what stands out for you as probably what is going to be the topical issue going into the 2024 elections? Or is it likely going to be the issue of electricity? Maybe? I think electricity is going to be the big one because it has a knock-on effect on all others. Yeah. Uh, it has an effect on, on crime and criminality because if there is darkness, uh, criminal activities can continue unabated. Mm. It is having a devastating effect on our economy. And if you look at manufacturing output, you look at the contraction of, the, of GDP, it's all as a result of the government's inability to get to grips with this load-shedding crisis. Mm. Um, and I think that the party that's able to show very clearly the solutions on these issues, as we are doing in the Western Cape, where we intend that municipalities like Cape Town and Stellenbosch will become the first areas of the country that are load-shedding free. I think we're going to be able to demonstrate to people that things can change. Secondly, I think it's about jobs. We have a massive unemployment rate in this country. Mm. 30 million South Africans live below the poverty line in this country. Youth unemployment is the highest in the world. The big question is, who do you trust to get the economy moving? And again, the proof point lies of where we govern. The Western Cape, unemployment is the lowest. You have the better chance of getting a job in Deer Run, Cape Town, than any other metro in the country. And I think that those proof points are going to be the important ones. People need to see rather than hear what you're going to do. Well... Let's stay with the electricity matter for a moment. One of the columnists writing in the past week that if the ANC were to just give an inkling that they are sorting out electricity, there goes the dream for the opposition. The ANC will retain its majority, well, <laughs> possibly staying at just over 50%, but there goes your dream. Yeah. Well, I don't think that's the case. I mean, we, South African uh, voters are not one-issue voters. And I think it's a basket of terrible uh, things that this government is visiting on people, whether it's a massive rise in, in, in gender-based violence in the country, whether it's, as I said, the unemployment rate. I don't think the ANC is going to be able to solve the electricity crisis because they ideologically will not let go of the notion that the state must control all. Mm. And we've already seen the electricity minister backtracking on the unbundling and breaking up of Eskom. Mm. And if you kind of continue to use the same model that's led us into the situation where we sit with record blackouts uh, in, in this country, you're not going to move the needle significantly. Mm. But as I say, I think there is, a, there is a basket of issues that South African voters are going to be looking at, things like the cost of living, things like the quality of education, things like health care, things like local municipal services that I think will, it will drive voter behavior in the coming e election next year. Well, let's talk about the elections next year because you say that perhaps the biggest talking point is going to be the coalition talks, and which is why you then proposed the moonshot pact. Mm -hmm. The people that you already are in bed with, at least at local government level, they're saying that the moonshot pact already exists. <laughs> what needs to stop is the DA's arrogance. Respond well, to that. Well, I think that the arrogance is to think that as a small group of parties, excluding the DA, that you're going to have a shot at unseating the ANC. Yeah. The reality is that, and the numbers don't lie, there's going to be no alternative to the ANC in South Africa that doesn't have the DA at the heart of it. We are far and away the largest party, and therefore it makes sense that we are the party that should be initiating these. The smaller parties can, can sit and continue hurling stones at the DA, or they could accept the broad and generous open offer we've now made to work together. I think voters are in South Africa are tired of seeing opposition parties squabbling. And that is why I will be calling the leaders of political parties to sit around a table, to have it out and see what we can do to build something ahead of the election that's going to give the people of this country hope that we can unseat the ANC mm -hmm. and that we can keep the EFF out of the union building. Dr. Corne Mulder.
is the leader of the Freedom Front Plus, quoted on News 24 this morning as saying he welcomes the fact that you seem to have abandoned your earlier flirtation with the ANC. Your response to that? Well, there's only one party between the two of us that's been in coalition with the ANC, and that was his party when his brother was a deputy minister in the nine wasted years of Jacob Zuma. Um, we have been very clear. Our goal is not to form a pact with the ANC. It's to form a moonshot pact with smaller parties. And I think that sort of tweeting and that sort of message is precisely the small politics that voters want us to leave at the door when we have this meeting and go forward. And that's why I've called his leader, Peter Grunewald, to the meeting, not Cornel Mulder. I want leaders to sit around the table, eye to eye, and decide, are we going to make this work? Can we make it work? If people don't want to be involved with it, that's fine. If they don't like the idea, that's fine. But they're then going to have to explain to their voters why they're walking out on the very best shot South Africa has at redemption in 2024. I want to be specific. The comment around your earlier flirtations with the ANC. Is that something that... There's been no flirtation. There's been no flirtation with the ANC. There have been smaller parties, as we heard when Bongani Beloy... Uh, departed from his party who were making it clear that there had been flirtations. We've had no flirtations with the ANC. My goal is to get them out of office. But I've also been very clear that if the moonshot does not succeed, we will need to do whatever is available to us mm. in a least worst option to keep the EFF out of the union buildings. I've made that fundamentally clear in the speech yesterday. I believe, however, that we can bring opposition parties together, together with civil society initiatives, and build an ecosystem of change in South Africa that working together will make sure that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And that's where the hope lies for the future. Ex explain the least worst option. Well, and the least worst option would be to keep what, do whatever it takes to keep the EFF out of the union buildings. I think if they get across the threshold at the union buildings, South Africa will very quickly be put onto a trajectory of poverty, hunger and starvation, Wherever the EFF's policy suite has been applied, whether it's Zimbabwe to our north or Venezuela or Cuba, it's led to greater suffering and misery and no economic growth. We will work and do whatever we can do and work with whoever we can to prevent that scenario from taking place. Okay. John, I want to almost be clear on this question, but let me stop betting about the bush. Mm -hmm. Let's just take a listen quickly to what Helen Zille had to say, because I'm trying to push you towards a particular answer, but I don't think you want to go there just yet. Maybe Helen Zille will help us get there. Let's have a, link, a listen quickly. We are going to prevent the very worst outcome. And the very worst outcome is a coalition between the EFF and the radical economic transformation faction of the ANC. That is a disaster. That will cause massive disinvestment from South Africa, that will cause the RAND to halving value, that will cause the economy to collapse, that will cause many more people to be in unemployment. We have to prevent the worst case scenario. John, let's continue on the path of um, working with a non-RET faction in the ANC, because that's what Helen Zille suggests in that clip, but without saying it out loud. Well, let, let me be clear. I'm the leader of the party, and I determine which way the party's direction goes, and together with the federal executive. And we have agreed that our goal is to form a moonshot pact with opposition parties. I made it clear yesterday in the speech that if that fails, that we will do everything that we can, and no options are off the table to form something to keep the EFF out of the union buildings. And that's working with, with any party in the spectrum yeah. to prevent that from happening because we believe that that will be doomsday for South Africa. So, in essence, you would work with an ANC led by Paul Mashaki? I don't think, it's, I don't think that, that we can determine that yet because we don't know what the ANC would look like in a post-24 election environment. We don't know who will be in charge. We don't know who will still be around there. We don't know whether there's going to be a breakaway, how big their RET faction uh, aligns with other political parties that are now newly on the spectrum. What I can say, however, is that for the next 15 months, 
we are going to put our blood, sweat and tears into getting the opposition and civil society together in an ecosystem of change to form a pact government that will be able to ensure that we keep the ANC uh, below 50% and the EFF out. If that fails, we will then have to look at what the next least worst option will be mm. and what our voters and South Africans expect us to do to protect them from the devastation that will follow if the EFF get the keys to the union building. You know, I don't think I've ever asked you the question about what's so repulsive about the EFF. There's nothing repulsive about the EFF. It's their policies that are the problem. If one looks at their seven pillars, based on the Chavez Marxist econ economic model and their belief that the state should be the controller of everything in the country, including the owner of all land and assets in the country, it is precisely these policies that have caused state failure and, in Venezuela's case, the largest displacement of human beings in modern history. Those policies are repulsive. They cause suffering and poverty wherever they are applied. It is those policies I want to keep as far away from the levers of power in the union buildings as possible because I believe that they present the most clear and present danger to South Africa's socio-economic well-being. If they're not repulsive, fine, you talk about their policies, which are a problem. Why would you declare them political enemy number one? Are you not indirectly making them the center of attention before we even go into an effective election campaign? Well, I think that any election campaign that's going to succeed has to have binaries. There has to be a very clear choice for voters. And I think the starkest choice for voters is the doomsday that will exist if the EFF get near the seat of power and the hope and opportunity that exists if our moonshot pact is able to succeed and we are able to build this ecosystem of change and that the moonshot pact brings a government into, into power that's going to make sure that it is based on market uh, policies that focuses on upholding the rule of law, on fighting corruption and maladministration, on building a capable state free of cadre deployment and ensuring that we deliver services to all South Africans and that we start to lift people out of poverty and into opportunity. That will be the focus and that's what I want this Moonshot Pact to be able to achieve going forward. Yeah. Let's just deal with um, issues at local government level for a second. Dr. Moruna Makwarela is going to appear in court today for that fake certificate he presented. Some people are suggesting that you knew about this, but because of uh, perhaps your dishonesty, when it didn't suit you, you didn't, well, it wasn't disclosed publicly, but only when you started working with the other coalition partners, which include the ANC and EFF, then you brought it to light. Well, clearly, I can categorically state that that is not the case. We assume if anybody goes through the IEC vetting process, which is supposed to check the candidature of people, and we've had a number of people who've been, we've been notified to be removed from our lists for precisely the reasons that Dr. Makorela um, has been removed now as a councillor. We've had those people removed from our list by the IEC, people who are on two lists. And one assumes that when that person comes through the IEC process, that that has all been checked. Um, secondly, you know, it's impossible for us as a, the DA to vet the candidates of other parties. They've got their own internal processes that we, have, we don't have a seat at the table of. We've got to work with the tools God has given us when these coalitions need to be formed. And you assume in good faith that the people are there are people who have gone through the right vetting and processing. So it was unfortunate what has happened. And I'm sure it needs to clearly demonstrate that there needs to be a tightening up of the, of the vetting of, of candidates. And I suppose it's a salutary lesson for political parties as well to make sure that they are conducting their own internal processes uh, in that regard as well. If coalitions are a big talking point going into the 2024 elections, mm -hmm. how you've performed at local government level as leader in some instances of the coalition, what hope is there that this is something that is going to sell you come 2024, should the ANC, of course, not get more than 50 percent? Well, I think that coalitions are getting us unfairly a bad rap. And I understand why people are 
looking at Johannesburg, Ecoleni, and Chwane, and and rightly shaking their heads in, in disbelief at the squabbling and the uncertainty that's taking place there. But I would say that we're involved in over 38 coalitions all around the country, including in KwaZulu-Natal with the IFP, uh, in Limpopo, in the Western Cape with parties like the ACDP and Freedom Front. And all of these coalitions work incredibly well and deliver good, sound government. Places like George, places like Swellendam and Cape Agulhas, um, municipalities uh, in KwaZulu-Natal that are working. So the, you know, the, the difficulty in, in the Gauteng metros has been the massive over-fragmentation of the vote there, where you're now ending up trying to manage a 8 to 10 party coalition, which makes it very unwieldy. But we have to make these things work. And that's why I'm saying to party leaders, and I've made it very clear in the speech yesterday, let's have a reset. Let's learn the lessons from coalitions 1.0 and 2.0 after the last local government elections. Let's learn from those lessons and put together a pact where no party loses its identity, but that we can work together hmm. to be able to achieve a common objective around a common set of values and principles. And I think South African voters expect us to do this. They, they don't like to see the, the disunity in the opposition because there is only one winner in that, and that is the ANC. Yeah. Final question, John, as, we, as I let you go. How do you prevent the bleeding from your core voter base, that bleeding, of course, being affected through the existence of parties like the Freedom Front Plus? Well, I think that you know, everybody tends to see things in an either-or scenario. I think it is an and. Of course, a party like a retailer, like a, a TV station, I'd example, has to hold on to its, its core base, but it would be suicidal for our, any political party to just be happy with, with its base. Hmm. You've got to grow, and that is why it is very important that the DA strikes out on a growth agenda, and we drive issues that matter to ordinary South Africans across the board, particularly those 30 million South Africans living in poverty, and to show them that there is a better way and that their life can improve, but they've got to vote for that. And that's the case we're going to have to make over the next 15 months. So, yes, you've got to hold on to your base, but you also have to grow. In a polit politics, you like uh, is like a shock. If you stop moving, you die. We've got to keep growing and keep the momentum. Very, very important. And it's important, particularly in the DA's case, because we want to be a firm, stable anchor in this moonshot pact going forward. John Stenhazen, thank you very much for thank your you. time and uh, congratulations thank on you, you being re-elected re to lead the Democratic Alliance, the main opposition in the country. Well,